Welcome to Triple Trouble. We are here at the Hoyt factory together with uh, Douglas Denton, the guy who engineers the recurve bows. Um, and we've seen a lot of videos on YouTube about how to tune your bow and how to set up your bow. Uh, but I figured it would be interesting to hear it from the guy who designed the actual bow. So, um, yeah, we're going to set up this bow that I uh, put together in the previous video. So, uh, if you haven't watched that, go watch that video. Uh, and then uh, shoot it afterwards and, uh, and tune it. So, that's going to be the next video. So, I guess we, uh, we can start putting this one together. Absolutely. So, obviously, we need to open the boxes. So, we'll start there. Here. Yep, we've got the riser here, so we got the kit with the vertitude plates and Allen wrenches. Here's the riser. I'm gonna get rid of the boxes. So, so where do you typically start? Well, at this point, I would start with taking out the vertitude plate that uh, that we want to use. So we get a lot of questions with. You know, which vertitude plate's most popular? Um, honestly, the most popular ones are the high and middle, mm -hmm. but uh, it's really the option of picking the one that works best for your shot. So I would recommend playing with all of them and finding out which one actually groups best for your particular shot and setup. Yeah. So which one do you want to use, Chef? In my case, that's always been the medium plate. Okay, so medium plate is actually set in the middle. So we'll pull this out. And then there's two of these. Yep, we have two of the uh, the back plates. So we have the one that's for the middle setting, so we'll pull that one out. And then we have a locking screw and a brass washer. So that brass washer actually goes on the oop, goes on the boat there. Like so. And we'll screw that in. And then we'll take our Allen wrenches which are also in the package, right? They are. I like to use the Easton Allen packs. Uh, I actually have two different ones. We have the uh, the gray set actually has a, a wrench that works really well with a, a biter cushion plunger. And then, but I will end up using, utilizing these over what we have in the um, in the pouch, or what comes with the bow. Just for because convenience. For convenience, and, and I can actually get a little bit more torque mm -hmm. onto it. So with the, with this bolt first, so we have it just kind of loosely yeah. snug. Then I like to take the uh, cushion plunger and then we install that. And I want to make sure that that's installed before tightening up this bolt. Then I'll come through here and tighten it. If you tighten this bolt before you put in your cushion plunger, it can kind of rock the plate a little bit and it makes the cushion plunger want to be too tight to go in. So, okay. So next now, at this point, I would actually go ahead and install my uh, arrow wrist as well. Okay. So I've got a uh, Shibuya Ultima wrist here. Yep. Which I think is probably the easiest and most sturdy wrist that I uh, have used. Okay. So if you want to install that, like you would prefer. And what really makes it good with the uh, Shibuya rest is it fits perfectly around the biter cushion plunger. It really makes it a lot easier to line up and put on properly. So I typically would make sure that the rest is slightly pointing up. Mm -hmm. Do you do this as well? I do. And I, and I do the slightly pointing up just to make sure that I have good contact with that arrow because you don't want the arm of that arrow rest pointing down because then the arrow will want to slide away from the uh, the contact of the cushion plunger, and we don't want to have that. Yeah, so it's not much, but it's just that, like, maybe half a degree that it points up, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I like to set mine up like that. So. so at this point, too, I notice you have your triple trouble grip here, mm -hmm, I so do. I think we should probably go ahead and install that. Yeah. So can you tell me where you came up with the idea for the grip? So um, I like shooting a lot of uh, older bows, retro bows. Yeah. And uh, the Radian that I was shooting in the beginning of this year, yeah. uh, I was getting uh, like a really nice and relaxed uh, 
grip hand with. So then I decided to see if I could get my grip close to that one. Uh, and then I make some tweaks so that it uh, so that it felt good and so that I could shoot in a relaxed manner. Um, and I started looking back at very good archers in history, and most very good archers use a bit of a rounder grip, which is what I prefer as well. So uh, yeah, interestingly enough, so when I first started archery, I got the uh, uh, the opportunity to, to go to Daryl Pace's house. So Daryl Pace, if if uh, Archer from the past, and two uh, two gold medals from the Olympics, and he actually told me that he really preferred that rounder type uh, grip as well, because it actually helped the hand relax more. Uh, some more old school archers with uh, within the U.S., which was uh, Rick McKinney and Jay Bars, both like that smoother, rounded grip feel as well. So uh, I think you're kind of spot on with looking back a little bit of history and some of the great shooters from the past and what they like to use and seems like it's working really good for you. Mm -hmm. And um, so what would be the reasoning for Hoyt to make a flat grip? So when we look at what the top shooters throughout the world today, minus, minus you, Chef, is a lot of them are going with this flatter type grip. So to be able to have something that uh, is more kind of universal, uh, we end up going with the flatter, um, kind of a medium type wrist grip and it allows people to either uh, customize it for themselves. But the feedback that we get is most all shooters really, really like this. Yeah. I myself, I kind of adhere to what you like, is which is the rounder style type grip. Cool. Uh, it, it helps my hand relax, just like what you said. I think it looks great, but uh, it's obviously not ready to shoot yet. So nope. what's the next step? So now we install the site, and um, I typically, at this point, will we'll put, um, so I'll put the site on, then I will put the... Uh, string the bow, and then install the stabilizers. So Doug, if you will uh, Absolutely. line the sight, I will get myself a string. <laughs> All right. So we got the uh, sight block installed. We're ready to string the bow. So I'm actually testing between different uh, materials and uh, in my hand right now is a uh, Angel Majesty Pro string. So uh, I'm uh, testing if that works. And so far it's been treating me well, but uh, typically I'll shoot a PCY 652X Spectra. So. All right, so I like to put my string on the top limb. I don't know uh, which one this is. So, we got the top limb. Just put that on there. Okay. Got the bottom limb. And then we'll need to get a uh, stringer and string the bow. And then at that point, after we get the bow strung, we can install the stabilizers, obviously put the sight on, and then we're actually ready to begin the alignment process and the basic setup of the recurve. Okay, so let's string it. So the bow is strung. Um, so if we put the stabilizer on it first, yep. we have something to put it down with. So that's close, but uh, I have to put it straight first. So see, you're using the quick disconnect. Do you like using the quick disconnects on your stabilizers? Mm -hmm. I, um, I do like using quick disconnects, uh, mostly because it just saves me time. Um, and it's easier with a quick disconnect to uh, put my V-bar straight. So I've been testing a lot of bows, um, uh, testing a lot of different setups, and the quick disconnect is just untightening the bolt, tightening it again. And right. then, so it's also a convenience thing. And I see here you have a little, you know, I would call it an eye boat, mm -hmm. a little piece here between the bow and the V-bar. Yeah. So what's the reasoning behind that? So I previously always shot with a three-inch extender. Mm -hmm. um, 
and now I try to put the weight more backwards with longer stabilizers to uh, get more of a, uh, a slower aiming picture. Makes um, sense. But then if I had the V-bar directly onto the bow, I felt like the shot wouldn't break well. It wouldn't jump right out of my hand. Uh, so I put this in between, and that's like a good middle ground for me. Yeah, a good balance. So yeah. actually taking the V-bar a little bit away from the actual riser changes the balance and dynamics of the bow to where it actually has more of a, a, a colored traditional yeah. pop out of our hand yeah. with the recurve. So I'll uh, just put these uh, stabilizers on. So I see you have some new uh, stabilizers by Shibuya here. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, Shibuya sent me some stabilizers, mostly just to test them and see what I uh, thought, to give them feedback. And um, I have to say, some, some stabilizer brands claim that they have some vibration dampening. Yeah. Uh, these really do. <laughs> so I, I feel like these are probably the nicest stabilizers I've shot uh, in quite some time. Um, I am wait, still waiting for the uh, XL stabilization, mm -hmm. uh, so it's on its way to my house, but I haven't got them in yet, so I'm uh, not sure how they are. Right, okay. Well, I'll tell you what, these look absolutely beautiful. Yeah. But you got the V-Box as well from Biter. Yeah, I feel like the V-Box is, at this moment, the best damper for getting the initial shock of the bow uh, yeah, covered. Absolutely. So I use them as, uh, as well. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more with you. So yeah. here's your front rod. So I'm going to take your sight. I'm going to go ahead and put your sight ring here on it. So this is the uh, Excel sight, and I see that you also, of course, have your uh, your branded scope on here as well. Yeah. So that's what they uh, refer to as the uh, Curve RXF, and then uh, sometimes they refer to as a Chef scope. Yeah. Um, it's for me. It's the ideal scope. It has a, a nice big ring, so you don't have to focus too much on it to still see it. Um, it's bright in sunlight, it's uh, bright indoors. Um, well, you also have this, uh, I'm going to call it a rheostat, right? That yeah. you can move this shield around to the top to exactly, actually, yeah. on really bright sunny days, if, if the fiber is too bright, you can kind of yeah. change it. And, uh, and I would say mostly I use it when the light is coming from behind the targets. Okay. So, so the target's dark and your, uh, your sight is light, mm -hmm. then I'm uh, typically closing it so that I but on a really bright day, I just like to have a bright fiber and they'll see it nicely on the target. So, you All want right. to put it on there? Yeah. Here you go, I'll let you do that. And then, so now we're at a point that we have the bow completely put together. Yeah. What I do here, I can see, here, let me take this bow. We actually have a chair. Uh, we're going to put the bow on a chair because it's important when setting up a bow, and you're going to use the biter alignment gauges that we don't have the, the bottom limb, I guess, leaning on the uh, yeah. on its own weight, the mm -hmm. bow's weight on the ground. So I want to make sure that the limbs are off the ground. So we're going to spin this around, and we're going to set this up on a chair here. So you can see it's perfect with the V-bars the, on the bow. It sets here perfectly, yeah. and it gives you a really good vantage point to stand behind the bow and get a good alignment. Now, biter limb gauges, I use these all the time, and you'll see a lot of people that will use multiple gauges all the way up to the uh, string. I simply do not do that. The most accurate place to put the gauges to line up your bow is actually at the base of the limb. So, the reason I do it here is because it's actually the furthest distance away from the string. Yep. That in itself is the most accurate place to really get a good solid alignment. Mm -hmm. Now, after I get this alignment, I also do look at the limb tips to make sure the limb tips are good and straight. Yep. Because we don't want to make we don't want to have a, a twisted limb left or right. We want to make sure that they're they're perfectly straight. So, mm -hmm. so now we have the gauges both top and bottom. And now with I always kind of refer to it as the, the trinity. So I have the top limb, I have the bottom limb, and I have this front stabilizer. I want to make sure that all three of those components are lined up with each other. Yeah. This is where a lot of people will will have some disagreements or different fundamentals that they feel like the riser is is uh, more important. So a lot of people will take the, the top and bottom limb and line it up with the riser itself. I simply do not do that. We have an adjustment in the riser that allows you to adjust the both top and bottom yep. limbs to get them both in line with each other 
And I do think it's extremely important to have these limbs in the plane of where all the energy is going in line with the stabilizer. Yep. You have a lot of weight at the end of the stabilizer, and if the stabilizer is pointing to the left or to the right, they will actually want to make the bow torque in your hand as you release. Yeah. So I never even look at the riser, only look at the top, bottom, and look at the stabilizer. Okay. So, so what do we do with this bow then? At this point, I would stand behind it, and I would put the string in the very center of the stabilizer. Yeah. And then, without moving my head left or right, I will glance up to the top and bottom and of the gauges and make sure and see where they are yeah. to, to start the alignment process. So with what I see here, we have a little bit of space, call it, mm -hmm. on the top limb, yeah. on, the, uh, on my right side, and on the bottom, we have a little bit on the left. Okay. So I now will take our allen wrenches, and at this point, I'm going to So, we have a space on my right side, Yeah. so the sight, uh, sight mount side of the bow. I'm going to loosen that set screw and I'm going to tighten the opposite one to push the string over. Yeah. So now I'm going to take a look here. So that's almost perfect and now looking at the bottom, so we still have, so now I'm going to take this and I'm going to tighten this. And what I do here when I tighten, I use equal and opposite forces. Yeah. So take this um, out. And this is why I like using the, the Easton Allen packs because I can actually get a lot of torque on here. Yeah. And that's really important. You want to torque these down yeah. to where they're really tight. So now I'm going to go down to the bottom here and I'm going to loosen the sight window side or my left side. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just do a small little turn here. Let me check the alignment. Got a little bit more to go. And there we go. It's absolutely perfect. So we have, now I'm going to go through here and tighten these up as well. And so now what we have is the fundamental basic setup. So I have the top limb, bottom limb lined up perfectly with the um, fighter gauges. Yep. But then if you project the string, the string projects directly down the center of the stabilizer. Yeah, so the force of the arrow will go straight into the stabilizer and not kick a certain way. Correct, absolutely. So right here, very simple process, really quick to do. Yeah. And now you're ready to go set your center shot. Yeah, which we need an arrow for. We do. Okay, so now we got the bow lined up. We have an arrow, but you know one thing we forgot to put on? Clicker. Your oh, clicker. I can do without. <laughs> So a biter clicker because I don't see a reason to get any other clicker than this one. So I see you already have your knock point set. Yeah. So we'll get the arrow on. I typically start when I set up a bow. I have a quite a long draw length, um, and I start with a knocking point of 10 mils, uh, which is in inches. It's. <laughs> around a uh, three eight. eighths, yeah. yeah, around three eighths. So everything's still on the chair. We still have the biter gauges on. And what I'm looking for is when the string is down center of the biter gauges, I want to see basically half of the shaft. Now that's when using an X10. Yeah. I want to see half of the X10 on, for me, the left side yeah. of the string. So that is really the what I've seen throughout the years of working with some of the top shooters throughout the world mm -hmm. of where everyone lives with their center shot. Now there is a place when we go to the, the tuning yep. that you can play with that. But for the initial setup, we're going to step behind and start lining up. One thing that's really good too, so you can actually see the, uh, the contrast is on the floor in front of you, to put down you know a target on the white side, yep. so you have a really nice good contrast. So. What I see here is fundamentally the arrow is actually almost directly behind the string. Okay. So in that case, we would need to loosen the cushion plunger and probably make like a quarter to a half turn. 
and start to push them down. Or you could also, if you use a Shibuya wrist, you can use that one to <coughs> oh. tighten the. Yep. Because they are both the same size. So you said upwards. Correct. We want to push the the uh, arrow further out. So. So make sure that you have this uh, adjustment. Yep. We uh, need to have that locked. locked. So. So that's locked. Yep. And then. Uh, I need to adjust it. Yeah, and you know, quarter to half turn, I think will will probably get us to where we want to get. So or that's where a quarter turn. Yep. Yeah. So, Do you so I don't it? I don't lock it down yet okay. because I want to put it in and I want to double check. And then may I see the wrench? It's also important to lock it down where it's going to be when you're shooting it. Yeah. So that way. Everything's locked down. It's pushed all the way where it's going to be when we're actually shooting. And that's exactly where we wanted it. So okay. I have basically half the shaft on the left side of the string. Now at this point, because we haven't locked down the set screws, we do want to go ahead and lock those down. Yeah. So we can get to one of them here, and then I would typically loosen just so to make it a little easier to tighten that next set screw. Um, with small screws like these, I would never really uh, like really really tighten it, but just uh, like give it two fingers, and when it's uh, when it's locked down, it's locked down. And there's a reason for there being uh, two locking screws, so oh, so you can throw your thing on the ground. <laughs> so if one were to vibrate loose, the other one would keep it in place. There's no reason to to really like give this all you got, you just need to uh, like give it a little bit of tension, and that's enough. So this prevents you from breaking uh, any threads or uh, messing up your plunger. So get that tightened back down. Yeah. And then I would say this bow is set to go shoot, right? Absolutely. There's a couple things that we can check while we're doing the tuning process, which yeah. is the tiller. And the brace height, yeah. but typically I always check that when I'm starting my uh, bear shaft tuning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for the people who are wondering, I typically start off with a uh, even tiller, so zero millimeters difference between top and bottom, and about a 23 centimeter brace height. So that's where my starting point is, and then while well, fine tuning, uh, we can discover what works best, uh, which is what we're going to do in the next video. So we're going to see what the bear shaft does. Um, well, we're going to do some plunger tuning and uh, yeah, see how the bow shoots. So uh, I hope you tune in for that one. If you haven't seen the uh, video where I put this thing together, uh, go check that one out. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this one. So uh, see you on the next one.